Welcome back, everybody, to the Pittsburgh Pirates franchise here on MLB The Show 20. Today, we are now in the month of June. You know what that means. Major League Baseball amateur draft time. That is right. Time for our Pirates to draft. Coming off an okay month of May. I believe we went 514 and 14. And we now enter the new month. Currently first in the division. But it's been a tight race since the start with Chicago and Milwaukee. So... Obviously, in the past, we've had top picks to pick blue chip players. In season one, we had the seventh overall pick. Last year, we had the fifth overall pick. And we got two cornerstones for our franchise in Santiago Osuna and Pablo Cairo. Both of them have been killing it in the minors this season. Both of them will likely be in the majors next year. So definitely watch out for that. But since we were a pretty good team last year, we're not going to have an opportunity to likely get a blue chip player. Uh, we had the 19th pick. That's because... Uh, we are the best team to miss out on the playoffs. And uh, based on how this season's going, we'll probably be picking in a similar range. We were 37 and 25 at this point last year. Now we're 36 and 26. So uh, I think we'll be picking a little bit lower. I think this team will make the postseason. Uh, but we'll just have to see. So here's a look at the blue chip guys. Certainly a few relievers. Brooks Conway, Antoine Herrera. A catcher, Johnny Cates. Looks like he could be a good defensive player. None of these blue chip guys really pop out all that much like Santiago Osuna did in season one and like Pablo Cairo did last year. I think the best blue chip player in this class is probably shortstop Luis Valdez because he's only 18 years old, which is a big thing for me. Both Osuna and Cairo were 18 when we drafted them. A guy who obviously has plenty of upside, but is also decent right away. Valdez has an MLB ETA of 2023. And it shouldn't take too long for him to progress and be a good player. So after that, uh, it's pretty much just a crapshoot. We just got to find the best players who have potential, aren't terrible right away, have at least like 50% scouting accuracy, and are young. Those are the four things I look for in a player. And I'm just trying to go best available with each of my selections. Unfortunately, this draft class really wasn't that deep, to be honest. So that made it harder to try to find good talent. But obviously, I did the best I could to find guys who uh, could be potential good Pittsburgh Pirates. So I found a few guys I liked before the draft, kept my eye on them, and now it's time to start. Julio Coronado, a center fielder, goes first overall to the Orioles. So here we are at 19, and the selection will be left-handed starting pitcher Robbie Cortez, an Indiana native, 80 potential, 65 overall, 2023 MLB ETA. I don't think he'll be ready in next season, which is 2023, but I do think he'll be a decent player early on. Uh, the big thing for me with pitchers is walks per nine. That is a huge indicator in Sim for whatever reason. He is max walks per nine, which is big, so I think that could be a really solid selection. Now in a round two, taking a little bit of a flyer, Mark Irabu, a shortstop from Japan. His MLB ETA is later than 2026, which I don't love. But as I said, there aren't many great players in this class, and I figured it was worth to take a shot with him. Round three, Art Rosado, a 19-year-old outfielder from Arkansas, has a really good bat. Obviously, when I look for position players, power and contact really come first for me before speed or defense. Uh, with our next pick, we're going to go with Kendrick Davila, a first baseman from Indiana. He's 23, which is a little bit old, and he's still kind of raw. But I do think he has some pretty good skills and could be a solid player. Uh, round four at this point, I wanted to go out and get a reliever. There weren't many good ones on the board. So we decided to settle with Rob Hills from California, a righty, only 19 years old. There are only three closers left. He was by far the best one. So once again, pretty much just a shot in the dark. Now on to the fifth round, we would select Jonas Bermudez, a left-handed starting pitcher. From the Dominican Republic, a guy who I think could be a solid player early on for the minor league system. And then round six, there really aren't many good players, so we're just taking a blind guess at this point. Going with shortstop Julio Lopez from Alabama, speedster, great glove. Not a great bat, but he provides a lot of other things. So that is how the draft will end. As long as we can get a few guys who have major league upside, this would in fact be a successful class. And bang! I'm pretty happy with this. So Robbie Cortez, our first rounder, is a 63 overall 
with 81 potential. Would have hoped the potential would have been a little bit higher, but I can't complain. He does look like a solid player. He'll be in the minors, certainly, for a few seasons. Hopefully, he's eventually ready, and uh, he will be signed to a contract. Shortstop Marky Rabu kind of looks like a bust, 78 potential. Only a 47 overall. He just does not look good. This was definitely a waste of a second-round pick. But who knows, maybe he can progress, but I just really don't see it with him. So this was kind of a bad selection. Round three, Art Rosado. I like this one. 70 overall, only 76 potential. But I think he has an opportunity to make an early impact in the minor leagues and potentially be a bench bat for us. He is a major league quality hitter against righties already, decent against lefties, and also has good speed. Our next pick, Kendrick Davila. Uh, he has a solid bat, good glove. He's a 55 overall. I think he's a little bit better than his rating suggests. However, he's not a great pick either. Round four, the steal of the draft. Rob Hills, 67 overall with 90 potential. I did not think we were going to get an A potential player this year, but I was wrong. Rob Hills would was quite a steal pretty late into the draft. Excellent, excellent selection. Round five, Jonas Bermudez, 63 overall, 73 potential for this late in the class. I'm really not upset with this selection. I think he has a chance to potentially be a long reliever type player in a few seasons. Uh, but for now, he'll probably start in double A. And then the final selection, Julio Lopez, 56 overall, 75 potential. He's a better shortstop than the guy we picked in the second round. So, yeah, it is what it is. I think Julio Lopez could be a decent player uh, in the minor leagues. Don't know if he has a major league future. So, all around... I'm pretty happy with this draft considering the circumstances and considering that it really was not that good of a draft class. So let's look at the rest of the league. Uh, the Cardinals got a really good center fielder in round one, Caleb McKay. That looks like a phenomenal selection, not really much after. Diamondbacks had a pretty quiet draft. Rockies, they found a nice steal late. Nick Stauffer, a starting pitcher. Dodgers didn't do a whole lot. Padres got a decent outfielder, Mitchell Denton. Giants got a solid shortstop, William Ishikawa. Julio Coronado, the top pick, 49 overall, 91 potential. Not bad, but for a number one pick, uh, I think he could have been a little bit better. The Red Sox got themselves a steal. Starting pitcher Derek Madden, 65 overall, 90 potential. He cannot field to save his life, but that looks like a good pick. Yankees got a great outfielder, Casey Andrade. That kid looks like a stud, and the Yankees actually had a phenomenal draft. Three other players with eight, at least 87 potential, so they hit it out of the park. Rays had a solid draft. Blue Jays got a few guys. Uh, the White Sox got a power-hitting outfielder. Indians got a decent catcher late. Tigers got Antoine Herrera, a closer. He looks solid. And then their final pick, Greg Lacy, Absolute steal. Royals got an A-potential closer, Brooks Conway. Twins got a few high-potential guys. Angels got a catcher I was looking at. Mackenzie Agula probably would have picked him in the second round if he was available. Uh, Mariners got a 94-potential catcher. Rangers got a pretty good outfielder, Steven Rosario, who is 93 potential. I don't remember him being a blue chip guy. I could be wrong. Astros had a nice draft. Uh, the Braves had a solid selection. Uh, the Marlins got a pretty solid catcher. This was an okay catcher class at the top. I wanted to get a catcher. I obviously couldn't. Mets got a steal. Miguel Murillo. Murillo. Okay, there we go. Um, that guy looks like a monster. Reds got Luis Valdez, 71 overall, 98 potential. 98. This kid looks like a monster. And he's going to be in, in our division, so definitely keep your eye out for him. And that'll pretty much do it. Not a great class, but there were more A potential players who were not blue chips than normally. So I suppose that's interesting. So after sending about a week and a half, not a great start to the month of June. Uh, but now we got a two-game set against the Brewers, who are currently half a game ahead of us. We've lost game one and are going to try to win game two. The Cubs are also half a game ahead of us, so this division race continues to get closer and closer. I think the Cubs will still continue to get a little bit worse as the season goes along. Their roster is just not as good as ours or Milwaukee's. Looking at the wild card race, there are about seven teams, no cap, literally about seven teams who are right next to each other. So this playoff race is deadlocked, a bunch of teams right next to each other. So this means that we got to play better baseball than pretty much all of these guys to make the playoffs. So we got to continue to play well, try to add a few pieces at the deadline. Let's take a look at the numbers. Brian Reynolds doing Brian Reynolds-like things, continuing to have a great year. 
Eduardo Escobar has been solid. Josh Bell uh, has not had a great start to the month of June, but he did win player of the month for May. Carlson's doing well. Benny Ling obviously having a very solid rookie year. Bo Bichette, like to see more from him, but still decent. Francisco Mejia has been the most underrated player on this team, in my opinion. O'Neal Cruz having a really solid year. I've been looking at the bench for the most part. Everyone's doing well. Cabrian Hayes is actually starting to play a lot worse, which does kind of suck. Uh, but other than that, for the most part, Yandy Diaz has been great. Kana, Hanager, Astudio, they've all been good. And then looking at the rotation, obviously our big three. Jamison Tyone, Julio Urias, and Joe Musgrove have been phenomenal. Jordan Yamamoto, Mitch Keller have both been good too. Brandon Waddle's been solid. But then the bullpen, you all know this is where things get bad. Jace Fry's been having an awful stretch of the past month or so. Arroyo's Vizcayano still been bad. Uh, Emmanuel Colasse is starting to do a little bit better. Michael Givens has been mediocre. Ryan Presley has been like our only consistent reliever. Even Ken Giles has got that ERA creeping up a little bit. The whip is phenomenal, but 3.65 ERA, that's nowhere near what it was a month ago. A month ago, it was at like maybe two. I think it might have been sub two. So even he's not playing all that well. So here we go. Miller Park, the location for this one, the 40 and 30 Brewers taking on the 40 and 31 Pittsburgh Pirates. Pirates would love to avoid a sweep here, try to stay afloat in the division. Here's a look at the lineups. One to nine. Catcher Dominic Miri G Miro Gilo. That's a fun name to say. Making his major league debut in this one for the Brewers, as on the mound for them would be for himself. Noah Syndergaard, the big free agent signing, who's having an okay year. 3.59 ERA, 1.14 whip. He's playing well, and for Brewers pitcher standards, he's doing great, but you would like to see a little bit more from your ace. So here's Brian Reynolds, first batter of the day. Going to whip a single in the right, so the Pirates got themselves an early base runner in this one. As Reynolds continues to get that average up consistently in this series, hitting right around that 320 to 330 range. The following batter, Eduardo Escobar, rips a single into center. So quickly, the Pirates got two aboard and no out. That'll bring up Josh Bell. Uh, we know he's quite good with runners on, and uh, he will hit a single. So the bases are now loaded. Still no outs, remember. This is where things get interesting. Dylan Carlson up, 1-2 pitch. That one is hit high and pretty deep in the left. Would be uh, going off the wall. Reynolds comes home to score. However, Eduardo Escobar was going to be out, so he tries to go back to third, which is where Josh Bell already is. So Bell gets tagged out. And the weird thing is the catcher, uh, Miri Gilo, Miro, that's, that's, that's an annoying name to say. He gets hurt on the play. And he's going to be out for an extended period of time by, I guess, just tagging Josh Bell. And apparently it's a serious injury, so he could miss significant time. That sucks. In the very first inning of your major league debut, you get hurt like that? That stings. Next batter, Benny Link, going to ground into a double play. So despite all the craziness, the Pirates only get one across. They lead it 1-0 as we go to the bottom of the inning. Julio Urias would take the mound in this one for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Currently 7-3, 2.93 ERA, 1.32 whip. Continuing to have a really good season coming over in the offseason from the Dodgers. Here's where I pay Polanco, the first batter, going to hit a single. So the bats have been looking quite solid to start this game off for both teams. Two on, two outs now for Keston Hura. He's going to strike out, and Milwaukee leaves a pair of runners on base as we advance to the second. The catcher, Francisco Mejia, lines that one deep in the right. Does it have the distance? It does. Francisco Mejia with his 15th home run of the season, continuing to show that he's one of the top hitting catchers in baseball right now. Pittsburgh now up 2-0. Let's go to the top of the third. Eduardo Escobar up at the plate, and he's going to go off Popo deep in the left. Pittsburgh will now make it 3 to nothing. Escobar with his 11th home run of the season. And Noah Syndergaard has gotten hit around so far in this one. The Pirates' bats have been awesome to open this game off. Later in the third, here is Benny Ling. He's going to get plunked right in the kneecap. That's got to hurt. Ling will advance to first. Now two on, one out for Bo Bichette. Pirates just got to keep the Indian afloat, avoid a double play. And that's what happens. 3-6-2. The Brewers infield is more chemistry than a science project. As we now go to the bottom of the third. Brewers going to try to make this game a little bit closer. And that they will do. Jorge Polanco 
will go deep into left center, his fourth home run of the season. Not hitting for a ton of power, but he is still one of the better bats in baseball. Scores now 3-1. Here's Christian Yelich now. He's just a winner, Shapa, because he's just looking. Top of the fourth now. Here's Francisco Mejia coming off the home run, and he's going to look at the high fastball. Nice pitch from center guard. Bottom four now. Miguel Sano swings at the low changeup. Urias continuing to get into a groove as we go later in the fourth. The former Pittsburgh Pirate, Logan Hill, goes deep in the left, but that was awfully close. Did Was it fair or was it foul? The umpires and Eduardo Escobar going to talk about it. Hopefully Escobar is trying to convince them that it was foul. And if you look at this one, it's close. However, the ball is clearly in front of the pole as it goes from right to left. So that means it's foul. And the umpire, who's awfully excited about his ruling, will agree the home run does not count. Score remains 3-1. to one. Logan Hill instead will fly out to center. So pretty underwhelming at bat for him. He obviously wanted to get revenge on his former team and clearly was unable to. Let's go to any number five now. My long locks brethren, Noah Syndergaard, starting to pitch a little bit better as he gets Brian Reynolds to go down looking on the 97-mile-an-hour fastball. Next batter, Eduardo Escobar. He's playing well so far in this one, and that ball goes off of Syndergaard's fingertip. That might cause a boo-boo, might cause some swelling uh, to one of the fingers on his right hand. A little bit shaken up, uh, but he would decide to tough it out and stay in the ball game. But he might regret that because Josh Bell, the following batter, absolutely sends it deep in a right field. Absolutely crushed 451 feet. His 19th home run of the season. Bell continuing to hit for good power. Trying to make the home run derby again after winning it two years straight. Maybe third time's for charm. Brewers making a pitching change. Trey Supak is now in the game as Milwaukee just going to try to cut their losses. Supak would get out of the inning as Bo Bichette will get a weak fly out. The second baseman, Keston Hira, will make the catch as we go bottom five. 5-1 to one remains the score. Manny Pina, the catcher, will strike out. And now we go to the sixth. Jake Faria in for Milwaukee, having a nice year. 2.90 ERA in 38 appearances. As Julio Urias up at the plate. He hits that one nice into right, but Yelich robs him of a base hit. Christian, the ladies are yelling for Yelich. Take another look at that sick diving catch by Yelich. And now we move to bottom of the six. Brewers with only three hits on one run. They're going to try to change that. Two outs for Miguel Sano. That ball is hit deep in the left, and it does have the power to go over the fence. Milwaukee will cut the lead down a little bit, making it 5-2. to two. The Brewer mascot sliding down the slide. So a couple batters later, here's Tyrone Turner. Deep into right. That ball goes off of the top of the wall. Bell cannot make the play on it. That'll be an RBI triple for Taylor. Run comes home to score, and now it is 5-3. Taylor with his first triple of the year. And then the following batter, Logan Hill, hits a single into center. Taylor will score. Brewers will make it 5-4. This inning's looking ugly for Urias, and it won't get much better. Two on now for Corey Ray. That'll be a double. He was going to stay at first, is going to be safe at second. Now the game is tied at five with two on and two outs. Brewers going to make a pit, or Pirates going to make a pitching change, sorry. Emmanuel Clase will enter. Just going to try to get out of this disaster of an inning. And he would be unsuccessful. Jorge Polanco, shopping gap. Both runs will score. And the Brewers have put a six spot here in the sixth inning. And they did it all with two outs. Very impressive as the inning would finally come to an end. Brent Suter now in for Milwaukee here in the seventh inning as he is a lefty. So that means the Pirates switch hitters have to go righty, which is like half of this lineup. Here's Josh Bell. He's going to go down on the curveball. Now bottom seven. Keston here up at the plate, but that doesn't matter. Francisco Mejia guns down the runner. Part-time ball player, full-time sniper. And Christian Yelich has no chance of stealing that bag. Alex Claudio now up in the eighth, another talented lefty, as here is Bo Bichette grounding that one to third. Excellent play by Miguel Sano, a former Minnesota twin, to go and get the out. 
Following batter Francisco Mejia, another switch hitter, swings way too early at the off-speed pitch. He wanted to crank that, John, but was unable to. Ryan Presley now in here in the bottom of the eighth, sub-2 ERA, having himself an awesome season as he strikes out Logan Hill on the high inside slider. Manny Pena, the following batter, going to go down on the high slider as well. Successful inning for Presley as we go to the ninth. The flame-throwing closer, Josh Hader, another one of my lawn locks brethren, is in the game as lefty-on-lefty lefty crime here. O'Neill Cruz has no chance going down on the outside slider. Final attempt at the game to revive it is Brian Reynolds, who hits that one into right, and the Milwaukee Brewers will get the win by a score of 5-7. to seven. I think the Pirates are a better team today. However, the Brewers put up six runs on that sixth inning, all with two outs, which is very impressive, and they do get the win. The Pirates really could not hit once the Brewers' bullpen entered. No center guard did not pitch well, but the rest of the bullpen, I think, only allowed one base runner the entire rest of the way. Urias gets the loss. He looked great through five innings, actually five and a two-thirds innings to be exact, and then just fell apart at the end. And because of that, uh, he will get registered with the loss. The win in this one will go to Faria, his fourth of the season. And the Brewers are now a game ahead of the Pirates, and that's where we will leave things off. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Next one will be continuing the month of June. As uh, now we are third in the division, a game behind Chicago, one and a half games behind Milwaukee, which kind of sucks. But hey, we got plenty of baseball left to go. I'm sure this team can rebound, and I hope that this team can finally make the postseason.